Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Timothy Whalen. Welcome to my New York City apartment. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. I love the energy of New York, but I also love that you can be anonymous, and I love having this sanctuary inside of New York, because New York can be exhausting. And I love that I can come up here and I feel like I'm like uh, perched like a bird above the city in this like little oasis and of green and, and peaceful, and it's quiet. I'm Tim Whalen, and you're here in my Gramercy Park apartment. I'm an interior designer, but I trained in the arts, so I also help people buy art and do art consulting. This is an Emery Roth building. Um, Emery Roth was an architect who did a lot of buildings in New York in the classical style in kind of the 20s and 30s. And I had just sold my apartment at 39 Fifth Avenue, which was also an Emery Roth building. And I was looking around, and I just was so enthralled by the terrace space. The light was so incredible and the, the terrace was so incredible and the views looking north. I had the, the Met Life Tower. I looked at New York Life, a beautiful deco building and its golden spear on top at night. And I thought, wow, this apartment has possibility. Well, I was very artistic as a child, but my path was kind of, I was an English and art history major at Kenyon College. And when I graduated, I came to New York and I did a management training program on Wall Street and I was a banker in private banking for almost six miserable years. <laughs> I didn't really want to go into banking, I was going to go to law school, but my parents said you need to get a job, came to New York, got all kinds of job offers and uh, it was a great training, but I decided I wanted to get into the art world so I went back to school with Sotheby's in London. And then I did my second management training program with Sotheby's in New York, and I rotated around every department for almost two years, which was an amazing kind of learning environment. And you had any exhibition, you were taken around by the experts in each department, and it was just an incredible learning experience. After that, I started helping people buy art and antiques. I started consulting. Um, Sotheby's asked me to inventory a big collection of decorative arts at 740 Park for Saul and Gayford Steinberg. So I did that and then one night I went to the theater and I sat next to a lady at a dinner from Aspen who had a bunch of Joan uh, Mitchell paintings and I love Joan Mitchell. She's one of my favorite artists and she asked me to do her apartment on Fifth Avenue and 69th Street, right down from my office. And uh, that was kind of the beginning. And I was buying art and antiques for a girl that went to Kenyon, her father. And he was building a big house on Sutton Square and we were, we were buying all the antiques. And I was working with a decorator at the time and she was overly restoring the antiques and covering them with fabrics I didn't really like. And I kind of thought, wow, I, I might be able to do this better. And that's how it kind of came. That's how my business kind of started. This is my entry vestibule, which as you can see is very small. So I decided to kind of open it up with a beautiful 1930s Italian mirror that came from Philip's auction house. And it had a very low estimate on it and it unfortunately did not go for a low amount. And the light fixture is something that's made by an artisan in Paris. It's all rock crystal. And I just love the star shape and I wanted a little drama here and at night you can dim it. And it just gives a little atmosphere since it's not that big of entry vestibule. And then the art on the walls kind of greets you as you come in. I almost treated the art almost like wallpaper. This is one of my favorite artists called Stanley Whitney. And I just love, I love works on paper, I love gouaches, I love things that are tactile. So I love that you have a mix of like prints by Ellsworth Kelly, works on paper, and then this is a canvas by a Brazilian artist named Fernanda Gomez, I think. And of course my elephant. I love elephants and they have to have their trunk up. So 
that's greeting you with its trunk up to give you some good luck. I just always have loved elephants. It's the logo for my company, something about an elephant I love, but it's only good luck with the trunk up. So I only collect them with the trunk up. You'll see when you open my uh, kitchen cabinets. This moment here is the first piece of furniture I ever bought when I think I was 27 or 28 years old and I was working, doing the management training program at Sotheby's. And they had something called their arcade furniture sale, which is their lower end furniture. And again, it had a low estimate. I think the estimate was like 1,500 to 2,000, but it didn't go for that. But I kept bidding and I've had it ever since. And I love this piece. It's a very pure piece of English furniture, great color. The bust is a garden, a piece of garden statuary that I bought in Palm Beach. And behind it is this like razor blade piece by the German artist, uh, Rosemary Trockel. And I just love kind of the juxtaposition of the ancient bust with the contemporary art with a beautiful piece of uh, mahogany. This is Oliver or Ollie. He's a pretty mellow dog. He's a Canadian Ganaraskin. He likes penthouse living. He doesn't mind the concrete jungle. He's, he's very happy on his terrace. Well, that's one of the other tricks of living in a small apartment. You need case furniture and you need drawers. I keep table linens in here. I can show you. But one whole drawer here is filled with placemats, napkins. This apartment is located on Gramercy Park and it's kind of a special neighborhood because it's one of the only private parks left in New York. It's gated, it's kept up beautifully, and the architecture around the park is incredible. You have all these 19th century brownstones and buildings and other buildings built in the 20s. You have the National Arts Club, the Players Club. And then if you wind around, you have Irving Place, which is this quaint little street with lots of restaurants and bars. So the neighborhood itself is really special. This space is the heart of the apartment. And what I did is try to maximize the seating in this area because I love to have friends over and entertain. I think I've had 12 people here. What I like is that it's comfortable and I like that it's low hung and it kind of the extension of the terrace. I often have the doors open here, which is nice. So you get the fresh air. So these John Ray chairs, I sit in them every day, sometimes more than I do the sofa. Some people don't find them that comfortable. I love them. But what I love is just the construction of them and the caning and the, the scale of them. You know, now you see them everywhere, but when I bought them, they weren't as prolific as they are today. But these are original ones. They came from Patrick Sagan, who's the top dealer in um, Jean Ray and Corbusier chairs of this period. And I just love that they give a little bit of a, a kind of rustic. I love caning, so I think I wanted to bring the caning into this room with everything else to kind of go against the sleek lacquer that the rest of the apartment has. You know, this apartment has just a lot of things I bought on travels or things like I bought this little inlaid uh, Indian chest. I bought that in London at one of the antique fairs. And then a mix of kind of art that I bought over time. These uh, I bought at an outsider art sale. These are actually uh, Nigerian railroad ties that are made into sculpture. It's kind of my, uh, it's a poor man's Giacometti here. Uh, behind me is another art wall, which is chalker blocked filled with art, as you can see. Again, a lot of works on paper and photography. It's what I love. Um, the little piece right here is by Louis Baltz, and it's from his Industrial Park series. And it's a beautiful kind of minimalist photograph. And this is colorful gouache is by Philida Barlow, who's also one of my favorite artists. She died recently. She was a British artist who taught uh, at the Slade scale. She actually taught a lot of the great contemporary artists and was kind of like not that well known in her lifetime. Hauser and Worth kind of tried to champion her art towards the end of her life. I think she was close to 80 or 90 when she died recently. But I love her art. I love her sculpture. And this kind of makes me feel like I'm moving farther up into the sky uh, in this penthouse apartment. Books are really important to me. And one of, the, one of the challenges of living in a small apartment is where do I put my books? Luckily, I have an office with a lot of books in it. But I'm constantly reading and referencing books. So I designed the bookcase to kind of house the books. And the question was, where was I going to put the TV in this apartment? I thought about putting it on this wall at one point. 
but I didn't love walking into the apartment with the TV. Would have been kind of nice when you're cooking to have the TV there, but this was a better spot. So we designed the bookcases kind of around the TV and, you know, we measured the books. It's always important to measure your books to make sure they're going to fit for the depth. So we did that. And I lacquered the bookcase, which kind of took another element of the apartment to kind of bring it uh, together with the kitchen and the bathroom and the, the millwork in the bedroom. And then I added this beautiful custom Ann Morris library light above. And what's so nice about it is the scale. To, to get it this big, you had to do a custom. And it just gives a kind of balance between the criddle steel windows and this side of the room. And also I've mixed in, like, these are New Guinea currency rings. Uh, they're carved out of abalone shells, and I love them because they're so sculptural, but they're, I bought those too at an oceanic fair, I think, in one in New York, and then I collected them over time in Paris. And it was funny, these little, I'm not a big skull person, but these little skull bookends, uh, I was shopping with my old neighbor in my old apartment at 39 Fifth Avenue, this amazing Brazilian lady. And we bought those for her apartment at Mantiques. And she recently sold her apartment, very sadly, in New York and moved back to Sao Paulo full time. And she brought those over to my apartment and wanted me to have them. So they have nice memories as well. And then this is a Chinese uh, bench that I had bought for a client. And sadly, when the client passed away, it came up for sale at Christie's. And I bought this. And I love this piece. This is a David Hicks box that I bought at the David Hicks store in Paris years ago. Green's my color, so I was particularly fond of this, and I love anything David Hicks inspired. And then these photophores, I love photophores, and you always see them in metal or classic Louis the 16th photophores or Louis the 14th photophores. What I love about these is I had a, a plaster artist kind of take the photophore base and make these in plaster, and then I had hand-blown hurricanes made for them. Now you can't find someone to do the hurricane glass because I tried to make more, but I just love the, the juxtaposition of the design. The mirror I had made by Wyeth and the scale was really important. Again, I wanted to open up the apartment and at night what's interesting is if you sit in certain areas, you get the city buildings and the lights of the city from the north behind. And I also love how it opens up onto the kitchen as well. I think, I mean, obviously I was artistic as a child. I was always, you know, redecorating my bedroom. I was telling my mom what to change her dining room chairs to a ladder back chair from a cane chair. And I, so I was doing that stuff when I was younger. I think, I think I'm a very, beauty is very important to me. And I think I have a strong aesthetic sensibility that's grown over time. But yes, I think, I think it's something you're kind of born with and then you kind of hone your skills over time. So this is my terrace. It's the whole reason I bought the apartment. I'm just having this expanse off the kitchen, the living room and the bedroom makes such a difference. I tried to create kind of a green oasis where I was kind of secluded, but I could see the sky and the buildings beyond. And I have a fountain that runs that makes me think I'm in the countryside with a rolling river even though it's a restoration hardware fountain. I brought lots of planters in from different areas. This is a company in Belgium that makes these big planters and it's called Artelier Vercant. And I have a lot of boxwood because in the winter time, I also love, I love the expanse from the apartment of having the green hedge and the boxwood, even when it's not summer. But summer is my favorite time in fall out here and Ollie likes it too. This is a little seating area where you can have cocktails, read a book. And the terrace was kind of narrow. It's not the deepest terrace, but it's not the narrowest terrace. So I really had to play with the scale of everything out here. And lighting was really important. At night, I have nine wall lights that light the terrace. And some of the plant material is lit from below very subtly as well. So it has a great feeling. I love coming out here. I love the awning because it gives you a kind of tented feel. I don't know if and if you remember when you were kids and you had a dresser across from your bed and you put one of your quilts from your bed up and created a little tent and it gave you a feeling of comfort, that's what the awning does here. It was grandfathered, so I was only able to replace the awning footprint that was here. Otherwise, I would have run the awning the whole width of the terrace, so it covered all the areas. But it's just in this center area.
Now we're under the awning, which is kind of the central part of the terrace. The focal point is the fountain, looking straight through the doors from the drawing room with the two boxwood on each side. And then it's divided into the other side, which is the seating area, and over here, which is your dining area, which is one of my favorite areas of the terrace. I have great dinner parties out here. Probably the best month is September, October. May's pretty good too. And summer dinner parties are fun too, but I, I really like the spring and autumn dinner parties out here. I can seat uh, 10 people comfortably out here. I have two side chairs that pull out and I come out here for my morning coffee. I come out here for glasses of wine or a margarita at night. But this is kind of the best area. And I think what I love too is I love all the Cream City brick. And I love how you have this little arch moment over here, which goes back, which I've made kind of Ollie's area off the kitchen. But if you look down into the arch, it's one of my favorite things. It kind of takes you back in time. Pavers, Pennsylvania Bluestone that we have on a pedestal system. When I bought this apartment, it had these beautiful old terracotta tiles that were all over, but the co-op uh, made me uh, change it when I did the alteration agreement and the renovation. And I, I love the bluestone pavers. They've held up really well, and they kind of give a continuity to the whole terrace. As far as the plant material, I tried to keep it pretty structured and green. There's certain views I wanted to highlight and certain views I wanted to kind of make go away. So I have these great ivy walls in three places, one above the fountain, two at each end, and then I have a ilex hedge. I tried to create structure with green, with, a green, with green walls, and then shape with the boxwood balls. I have four boxwood lollipop topiaries, and I tried to unite everything with the pots, which are all this Belgian company that made these big square pots and all the round pots that you see up against the periphery of the apartment. I then tried to loosen it up a little bit because boxwood is a little stiff and more structured. So I wanted a little looseness, but I didn't want the terrace feeling overly uh, grown. I wanted it very edited and structured. And so I added, again, the ivy in the pots. I added climbing hydrangea against the wall uh, in the seating area. And then I tried to loosen it up. I love ger white geraniums in the summertime. So I've added white geraniums, I've added some white lantana, some allium, and this beautiful uh, purple verbena. I think my color palette, I think, in a garden is really greens, different shades of greens and chartreuses and light purples and whites is my favorite. And this is a autumn clematis, which will flower in September. And I've been trying to get it to cover the whole bench, but it's taking a little while. So gardens take a little time, even on a roof terrace. And the, the challenging thing about uh, potted plants versus things in the ground is that potted plants are a whole different animal. So it's a lot more upkeep, you know, the root structures are different, but I'm really happy the way the, the garden's now grown in. These were magnolia trees at one point, and at one point I had beautiful crepe myrtles here, and none of them did well, and so I put these, uh, dwarf crab apple trees in a couple years ago and they seem to be thriving. I put one in each corner. And again, these are in the same pots as everything else. This Belgian company that makes beautiful pots right outside of uh, Brussels. I love the fact that the color palette is kind of united throughout the interior and the exterior space of the apartment. Obviously I have this green heads that you look at, but then there's the striking black and white awning and the black iron on the criddle doors the black of the uh, custom-made urban electric light fixtures, the black uh, garden stool here, which is a vintage garden stool, and all the gray pots. I think having that kind of color palette, it, it unites the space and, and makes it more expansive. I love sitting in the living room and just looking out to the terrace with the fountain running and seeing the black and white stripe, which totally plays in harmony with everything I've done inside the apartment. Rain is a tricky thing in New York. I love rain and I love rainy nights. Uh, it can be very stressful when you're planning a big dinner party out on the terrace, just because I don't have a dining room inside my apartment. So where do you seat the people? But I think like anything in life, you have to improvise. And I had uh, 12 people for, I think 10 to 10 people for dinner, poured rain, stopped. We cleaned up the whole terrace. We reset the table 
skateboard rain again. Luckily, I had help that night, a lot of help. But it ended up pouring. I just rained the whole night for the dinner, and we all sat on the sofa with our food in our laps, and we had the best evening. So I think like anything, you have to improvise, but definitely having a dinner party um, and hoping that uh, you've been a good boy and the gods are cooperating that night is always a very good thing. Now I'm gonna take you into my kitchen. I mean, travel still inspires me, although I don't like to travel as much as I used to, but travel still really inspires me. I traveled a lot in my youth. Um, curiosity um, inspires me, so I love the art world, I love learning about art, I love artists, uh, nature inspires me. Uh, I find all those things very inspiring and I think sometimes you need them to feed your creative juices and to, to kind of make you rethink things in interior design. I think also fashion is interesting. I'm not a big fashionista but I watch fashion and I think watching fashion also inspires you with interior design. This is my kitchen, and what I love about this, after living in an Emory Roth building where I had a big entrance foyer, separate kitchen, I love the openness of living here, and I love how it's open to the living room. And again, because it's open, I have to keep things very neat and tidy, and I had to think about the surfaces and what you were gonna look at and what you weren't, and it actually works really well. I carried the same honed, Carrera marble, both in the bathroom and the kitchen, and I brought it up to the backsplash because I wanted to unite it, and I love the way it comes down on the side here as well. And then I high gloss uh, lacquered all the cabinetry with uh, a vendor that we use that does beautiful lacquer work, and what I love about that for this apartment is the reflective quality, because again, it's another element that kind of makes the apartment bigger because it, it reflects the light. And sometimes you can see, like even here, you get the black and white awning reflected in my kitchen cabinet, which again, I love. Kitchens are good unless they're utilitarian as well as beautiful. So while I'm edited here, this is a great kitchen. I often have uh, dinner parties where I have chefs cook here and it works perfectly. They also have to be a little neat because the guests can see it all, but it, it, seems, to, it seems to work and people seem to have a good time. In a small kitchen, I have everything I need. I have a big, deep sink. I have a little niche here. I also love niches in kitchens. Like I love where you can display beautiful, these are beautiful green David Hicks glasses, again, that I bought at the David Hicks store in Paris when I bought my box. This is the white uh, STA VA. I always mispronounce it, but I have it all over. I've had this um, porcelain God, before they even carried it in the United States, I went to the store uh, on, on the right bank, right near the Louvre in Paris. It's a beautiful little French shop that makes all this dinnerware. They made these pineapples. They made that mug over there. And there's also these plates that I love to kind of mix with it, which John Darian did as a collaboration with them. Like I said, a kitchen is not a good kitchen unless it functions well. I've got my dishwasher right here. I've got my sub-zero refrigerator with my flowers that I'm gonna put on the table for you in a little while so they don't get wilted. And I even have a washer and dryer, which is kind of amazing in New York City. So again, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier is really planning how you want to live in a small space. I knew that the washer and dryer was important to me to have and I was able to get permission from the building to do it and it makes a big difference. Even the drawers we had fitted out, which uh, I like that all my cutlery can fit. I like that things are organized. And because I entertain a lot and I don't like clutter in this small apartment, I have a lot of upper storage. Way up top, you can see my collection of Chinese export frogs, which I seldom get down from there, and my Christopher Spitz Miller jardinieres, and all kinds of Persian vases, and there are my elephants with their trunk up. And I think there's another mm -hmm. elephant. Uh, more vases. Oh, and another elephant with its trunk up, and more vases and things that I use for entertaining. Also, 
more storage. These are my antique paper mache wine coolers from Sotheby's. Little silver beakers, more porcelain. This is my friend Martin Lawrence Bullard gave me this from his design dinnerware. I don't really use his coffee mugs, but don't tell him. <laughs> I prefer my big white coffee mugs. I'd been collecting or buying things for a lot of years, so I had stuff in storage, I had things. So for me, it was kind of, kind of editing and curating the things I bought. Obviously, there's not a lot of wall space in this apartment, and so I had to be very careful about what art. I have a lot of art in storage, so I couldn't hang it all. So I think it was kind of curating things that I had bought over time, editing down, and really finding a palette that kind of meshed the inside and the outside and kind of brought the whole apartment together. Because when you're dealing with a small space, you don't want things to be jarring. You want it to be continuous and kind of harmonious. And I think that was the biggest design challenge in this apartment. This is a smaller one bedroom apartment. So I wanted to feel the expanse. It has high ceilings and this beautiful light and beautiful windows. So I kind of took off the color palette of the rest of the apartment. I kept this room a little more minimalist and black and white with less color. The walls are a soft gray and all the cabinetry is done in a high gloss, uh, beautiful lacquer, which again gives a reflective quality and it ties your eye into the lacquer cabinetry in the kitchen. Just to give you a continuity, this was all bespoke, we had it made. Um, again, thought a great deal about storage, shoes, shirts. Um, this is drawers in here. So you can open it up and I have a whole nother set of drawers. Um, also needed a chest of drawers for additional storage. This is an old Italian chest that I bought years ago at an auction in Chicago. Kind of neoclassical, probably very simple, probably from north of Italy, which I love. This is a 1960s mirror that I bought from CJ Peters. And then these are Nancy Lorenz little mirrors that came from Liz O'Brien. So I kind of made this like a kind of my idea of my wall of mirrors <laughs> at Versailles. This is one of my favorite pieces. It's uh, an artist called Ray Johnson. He's not as well known, but he's m very well known about within the artist community. A lot of artists' collections have his work. And Frances Beatty had a beautiful uh, show at her gallery, and I bought this piece. It's by, uh, a portrait of Emily Dickinson, which I also love since I was an English major. And uh, I just love the singularity of it on this wall. It's very strong, so it can carry the wall. With these beautiful mirrors, which are also kind of works of art in themselves by Nancy Lorenz, and I think this is by Sejan and something. It's a, they made these mirrors in the 60s. Again, I have too many books and I've slowly started to just pile them up on the ground, which some people might say is clutter, but for me, it works. These are Robert Keim wall lights. I did a custom lampshade on them with a custom trim. Again, what I've tried to do in the apartment, you have these beautiful black uh, iron criddle windows or steel. And what I love is how I'm looking at the back of a sofa, but all the colors and the stripes and the green wall kind of mimic what's happening in the interior of the apartment. This is a beautiful CNC Milano bedspread. This is a vintage uh, Suzani pillow. And then this is a great photograph of Lilies of the Valley. It's by Anessa Benu, their famous photographer. It's not really known for their uh, flower portraits, but they had a show at Gagosian and uh, it just had a lot of meaning for me because growing up in Wisconsin, we had a screen porch and uh, Wisconsin winters were long and cold and tons of snow. And every spring, this field of lilies of the valley would come up on the side of our screen porch. And so hence this piece of art, which is actually a photograph, which I love. What I also I think is special about this apartment is I have this window here where I get beautiful morning east light and it mimics to this window in the kitchen where I get beautiful west light at the end of the day. And this access point is so nice, but I also like to be able to close it off. So I have a door, pocket door here. 
And you know, pocket doors are great when you're tight on space if you have the room to fit them in because doors would have kind of encumbered here. I also lacquered this little alcove here, which also, again, brings the light, gives you a feeling of space and height right here. And then if you come through here to the closet and the bathroom, I also have French pocket doors that go here so I can close these off. This is my bathroom again. Materiality was a big thing. I carried the same marble that's in the kitchen in here and I lacquered the front of the vanity. Here I used a little Corian, but I kept it really simple. I just wanted a very simple bathroom. Again, you have the ceiling. I love that you have the window in the shower and that's my bathroom. We're about to go into the magical Gramercy Park with our key and we're waiting for the elevator. And this is my elevator lobby in my 1920s Emery Roth building. A little Syrian chest. Uh, the floor is Ferrazzo, it's original. Actually, it's one of the few original things on this floor, uh, which is nice with the mahogany elevator door. And it was pea green. I just painted it a little ferro and ball <laughs> to match the terrazzo. Um, and just took that stuff out of storage. This chest was in storage. These photophores were in storage. This is a little Renica Dykstra photograph that I bought from Marion Goodman Gallery years ago. And I had some green plants in here, but it doesn't do well. So now we just have some orchids. Yeah, it's funny, when I renovated the apartment, um, I wasn't able to uh, do anything with the elevator lobby. So recently I've been able to just kind of spruce it up with some objects and pieces from storage. And it makes me a lot happier when I walk into my apartment and I arrive on the 18th floor. This is the big key to the private Gramercy Park and you have to live on the park to be able to get a key. Um, our building has one on this beautiful key, <laughs> what would you call that, a key block? Um, and I'm going to take you into the park right now. Come with me. So we are in Gramercy Park. It's a beautiful little alcove in the middle of the city. It's just, uh, I don't know, I always feel like I'm transported into another world when I come to this neighborhood. I get off the bustling streets of New York and I take a left on 21st Street and I walk around the park. Uh, it has a kind of magical and as if time kind of has stood still for a, a moment. Uh, I love these little like side alleys on each side of the park with the park benches. It's just kind of a great moment to kind of sit and listen to the birds. Watch the light come through the leaves of these trees. The Gramercy Park Hotel was here, which was amazing, right to the right. It had Maialino, which was a great Italian restaurant in it. And there was always a fire in the winter time, fun bar. But it closed, unfortunately, right before COVID. And now a new hotel is opening. TWA Hotel is supposed to be opening a new hotel there, but it doesn't look like much work is going on there right now. Well, this is the central access of the park. You're coming from the west sides, from Gramercy Park West, where we entered. And this kind of brings you to the central access, which runs into Lexington on one side and Irving. So why don't you come with me and we'll walk to the center of Gramercy Park. There's your ode to Samuel Ruggles, who founder of Gramercy Park, founded it in 1831. So 
this gravel path kind of takes you to the central access of Gramercy Park. What I love is this center area. You look uptown towards Lexington Avenue and you have the Chrysler building sitting there right past your view and it's lit up at night. And if you turn looking south, on the central access, you have Irving Place. I think just the peacefulness and the quietness of just being, it's a, it's a, it's just the, the green and the peacefulness. And I feel, I feel like it's been preserved really well by Arlene Harrison and she really works on keeping the neighborhood, you know, keeping the park beautiful, keeping the neighborhood safe. I know it's a privilege to have a private park in New York, so it's controversial, but you know, it's totally funded by the Gramercy Park Association and the neighbors that run there. There's no city money for the park. It's just a very, very special place. Home to me is really, there's something about coming into this apartment where I feel like I'm in a bit of a cocoon. I love the size of it. I love the simplicity of it. And I just love, like I could come up here for a weekend. I'm, I'm part introvert, part extrovert. And I could come up here for a weekend. I could say that Ollie's ill and cancel my social plans, which is really a bad thing to do. And just, uh, read books and watch documentaries, sit on the terrace, hang out here all weekend, and be totally, utterly happy. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.